more time for our keynote speaker, Lucas Breschker, uh, to give his talk. Just really two words, because I think most of you know uh, Lucas Brescher very well. He is full professor of economics and resource economics at the ETH in Zurich, and is also the president of the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economists. Uh, he w has been in uh, Oxford as a visiting, uh, he has been around many universities, and among the many things that uh, he has done or is doing, I would like to mention at least one, to pick, pick up one, as a member of the, uh, as a negotiator for the Swiss government in the, uh, on the climate agreements, uh, and he's back from Bonn uh, last week it was, right? Okay. The week before, exactly. Um, so he is not a brilliant scholar, but is also very active in trying to implement what he's studying. So we are here to listen to his presentation on a basic climate model and to learn from it. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I try to stand to make it really outstanding. So. I hope this microphone works, does it? Okay, good. So, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. It's a great place. And actually, I want to do something which is really novel, which is new. And I think uh, this is the best place to try this out. If it works, then uh, it's memorable. If it doesn't work, well, we can probably fix it here at this uh, location. Well, okay. So I will talk about something I call basic climate model. And what I have in mind here is to talk about something which is unifying our efforts. Because I feel there is a lack of uh, 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 efforts to kind of come back to the basics. I think, so I will not uh, have a paper with 100 equations with Hamiltonians and with uh, Poisson Wiener processes as a, I like them very much. Uh, I will not bother you with this. Rather the opposite, I want to come back to the, to the basics of, of climate economics. And I will tell you why. I think there is a need for that. I think we have a credibility problem. We have many problems, but we have a problem of credibility with our colleagues, also with our students, with the policymakers. And I try to kind of come back to what, what we could use as a tool, if useful. So for teaching and for uh, our debates with the policymakers. And to show you already a bit the aesthetics, you have this model in, in between here. Actually, it's a bit too wide, so I tried to make it very harmonic. So now these proportions are not really what I had in mind originally, but maybe it's even better like this. So let's see where we start. So I think when we ask people what is climate economics, they say, well, climate change is a market failure. Of course, we have pollution, we have stock pollution. We need to fix it, a negative externality is something that we know. We have our textbooks, we have, uh, well, we have environmental economics, and there's just many, what, what our colleagues do when they, when they hear about climate uh, problem, then they go to the standard textbook and they say, okay, carbon pricing, and uh, basically then they think that's, uh, that's done. So we have a solution. We know we have a, a discussion about instruments. We could also do other things, but Pigou with tact, well, this is 100 years old. Uh, very well established, we can increase welfare and uh, we can reach the optimum. But, and now comes the but, well, recently we had several scholars, famous scholars, criticizing us harshly. Not all of us, but part uh, of us, I would say. Uh, there has really been something I've, I've, I've rarely seen in the literature, that we were really, we were smashed with critique. So let me see, I can read a bit what has been in the literature. For example, Bob Pindyke, Chair of Economic Literature, 2013. Climate change policy, what do the models tell us? Very little. And basically he would say nothing. So like you can see if you go down a bit, then he talks about these integrated assessment models. These models have crucial flaws, make them close to useless. Uh, well, uh, arbitrary, uh, whatever. Well, the models can tell us nothing about the most important things and so on and so forth. Another one is a bit more balanced, a bit broader. Uh, Farmer et al. in the Environment and Resource Economics 2015. And still it says, well, it's really, it's daunting and we have several issues not correctly addressed recently. We miss uncertainty, we miss uh, aggregation issues, we have no distributional implications. Technological change is not taken care of, and we have the problem of uh, finding realistic damage functions. 
and I will come back to this uh, later. Next turn, in nature, current climate models are crossly misleading. There's no urgent need for a new generation of models. And then it goes on basically with risk and uncertainty, tipping points and all that. Uh, so Stern finds our estimates of the social cost of carbon and basically what drives our optimal policies. These are way too low. Okay, now I think we are done. We have, uh, well, we have seen that. And uh, we have to kind of, uh, well, come up with a reaction. And of course, there's several things we should do. And we should think about what is really now missing. And I feel, I mean, I did, I did theory, I did empirical research, I did CG modeling, did many things in my life. But what is really kind of strange in climate economics is that we started out with some applied modeling, which was always shaky, which was not really solid, which was kind of uh, open to criticism all the time. And why not try to go back to have a solid theory? Something we can kind of agree on, on elements that we think should be included in such a theory. Then, of course, once we have that, then we should uh, Im improve on our empirics, we should have a uh, calibration, we should come up with robust policy conclusions. But first, I would see why not uh, try, at least, to find a better foundation and integration of the economic approach to climate change. Of course, we have to reduce a lot. Uh, it's so complex. And it, it, this is was the reason that people thought, well, you know, the economic side is complex, the ecological side is complex, and we, have to we cannot reduce that much, so we have to have complicated models. But in fact, everything is a chaos. Uh, financial markets, international trade, everything is a chaos. And, and yet, we have very solid trade theories, we have some theories for financial markets. Why not try to do something for climate change economics? So this is why I start, uh, try to start developing a basic climate model, and we could uh, argue what has now to be included. So I want to present this here, which would kind of a uh, unified theory, how we can analyze, think about climate change, climate policy, and we can talk to students, to colleagues, then we can kind of identify uh, different regions where we want to have different assumptions or we want to discuss, uh, uh, say, climate damage functions, we want to have uh, climate uh, pollution impact factors to change and to see what happens in, in our framework. And then with this framework we can kind of disentangle what are the different impacts of the model assumptions and of course it's, it's mainly for didactic purposes. It's nothing new that you will hear uh, today, but it's something like I want to, to synthesize what has been around and what I think is important. And, and some aspects maybe, you know, I, I did growth theory for a long time, I think long-term aspects are not well treated in, in many models, so this has to be further uh, strengthened. What has to be definitely included in my view, maybe you have a different view, but what I think is really crucial, we have to model a pollution externality, and we have, of course, a stock pollution problem with climate change. We have the accumulation of the stock of greenhouse gases. As simple as it is, but this has to be included. And on the other hand, we have a damage coming from this stock. And we have to think carefully about uh, what, what is the impact on the economy there. And we had many strange assumptions, many things done. On the other hand, we can try to do it deterministic, but uh, you saw already from the literature review, we also quickly have to go into stochastic theory. We have climate shocks and we have to include this as well. Not in all the models, not in everywhere, but we always have to take care that, well, it's, uh, climate change does not hit us permanently, but it, it basically comes in shocks and in, in bad events. Secondly, as I said, I think we have to take, necessarily we have to take the long run perspective. And there we have to think about something being accumulated, call it capital. And we have to have a very strong interlinkage between Pollution, capital accumulation, uh, resource stock depletion, this is the last because we're using fossil fuels. They are available in a, in a stock and this is depleted over time and we can still think about how this is done and everything. But I think this long run perspective dynamics, they are crucial. And the interlinkage between the, the resource stock depletion and the capital accumulation and then the pollution which comes out of it and the impact on the, on the economy again, this is what we have to find as simple as possible a solution for it. And then, as usual, we do this intertemporal welfare optimization. We can also think how this is related to sustainability. We do an impact analysis for different policies. And in the end, of course, we want to do some robustness checks. Damages are crucial. So how do we introduce them in a simple climate model? 
this carbon cycle or whatever it's called. How do we do this now, really? And people have put it in utility function. Why not? It could be. Uh, Nordhaus is doing it in current output and consumption, so there is a fraction of, of current output lost if, if, you have, if you have climate change. Well, also this will be an effect. But I stress really, and I think Stern is also, well, the same view, and, and many who think about growth process, and this is why I have these nice pictures here. When we have a climate uh, damage, when we have an event, then you have infrastructure and capital largely destroyed. So you destroy the cabinet. And what's the difference between the, the second and the third here? If you destroy the capital stock partly, you cannot rebuild it within one period in the next period. If you, if you, if you have a little bit less of output, uh, then if your inputs are, are, are still there, next period you can still have to enjoy the same level of consumption as you had before. When your capital gets destroyed, think about the small islands uh, hit by a hurricane, they really have huge problems to rebuild the capital, and especially when you're a poor country, a vulnerable country, you have to do this very often, then already you have a problem of, of saving investment and capital accumulation, and if the climate change hits you all the time, then of course this gets even worse. So this is really where I think we have to, to make a, a, well, a clear point that it is, a, a, well, it's hampering growth in terms of having an impact on, on the capital stock. So it's like a naturally induced capital depreciation. So some equations, but not many. Uh, we'll do two slides, and then, but very simple ones. And then basically I will, I will go to the, the graphical illustration. Because I thought you are quite a, a broad uh, audience, and uh, you have different backgrounds, and that this is what I wanted to test whether this would, uh, would work when we, when we visualize the whole thing. Because, you know, we have many of those equations. We include them in our climate models, but let's see how we can do it uh, graphically, what we can uh, derive. So first of all, we have fossil fuels, which are the original problem. We extract them, and we call the stock of fossil fuels S. S0 is the stock in T equals zero, and S dot is the derivative with respect to time. So whenever we extract R, R is the extraction rate in each period, then we diminish the stock exactly to the same proportion. And then the stock which comes out of the ground is, is burned, and then it accumulates pollution, which is P. And P dot depends on how much we extract in each period. And the pollution impact parameter is a phi here. Now one can say, well, this is kind of, the phi is kind of defined. We know how, how this translates. But one can say there is also pollution decay. There is some decay in the atmosphere. When we blow up the greenhouse gases, some of them will disappear. But, uh, you know, this, uh, this decay function is a complex issue. What actually happens, and we have climate scientists at ETH explaining this to us very clearly, some of this pollution stock will relatively quickly disappear and the rest of the stock remains for a very long time. So what I do when I, uh, when I uh, abstract from the decay, I say, well, I, I take it net of that what is uh, immediately uh, reduced, or say within the first years, the other stock is, is remaining for, for 1,000 years, say, so I don't have any decay rate, of course I could include a decay rate as well. What we sometimes do is to have something in proportion to the, to the stock, which is then like, a, like a renewable resource, but this is uh, not really correct in terms of the climate physics. But of course, it's convenient in economics to have something like a decay rate which is proportional to the existing stock. One can do it. I don't do it here for simplicity. Then I have no separate equation here for temperature because uh, we have, according to the work group five uh, reports of the YPCC, an almost linear relationship between pollution stock and uh, pollution stock and, and temperature, so I don't need a, a separate equation for temperature. So there is not, nothing like a concave uh, impact of, of pollution on temperature. It's, it's linear and so it can be transformed directly. And finally, the climate damages, uh, I call them D. They are a function of P, of the stock. Of course, the higher is the stock, the higher is the, uh, the damage. And then we have to include this damage into uh, the economy and as I had introduced it earlier, I want to have it uh, depreciating the capital stock. So D will go into capital accumulation. And when you have lower capital, of course, then the growth rate is affected. And if also, if you have a lower capital, of course, if it's an input in current production, you also have a level effect in every period. Second slide with equations. So this is my economy. I have a two-sector economy. I thought about the simplest economy that expresses more or less what I want to have here. So I take capital accumulation being dependent on capital and, uh, well, capital as an input, exogenous productivity B. And then, of course, I have a, a, a 
well, use capital A for capital accumulation and for final outputs, and the, the, the uh, allocation of capital to the two sectors is given by this epsilon. This is, if you will, it's, it's, it's a Rebello 91 model. It's an application for the Rebello type of model to do climate change. If I put everything in one sector, it's, it's not so convenient. So I have the two sectors separate, and uh, you know, as, as I'm, well, uh, I did some work in endogenous growth, as long as this B is a constant, and K goes in a capital calculation in a linear way, you will have an endogenous growth. Uh, depending on now what the second term is doing, second term is about the uh, depreciation, the natural induced uh, depreciation, and of course we have to define a D function, and then we can see what happens with the growth rate. So eta is the impact uh, parameter, and D is the, the, the damage that comes from pollution stock. Final goods production, simple, Cobb Douglas, also there, one can do many things, we did many things uh, recently, but actually uh, this is uh, what I want to work with, and as I said, this uh, epsilon says how the capital is allocated, and also household utility, one can do more fancy stuff, here's a, 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 a conventional CS uh, utility function. Now, I could solve this thing, and of course uh, we'll do this, and then you can have your Hamiltonian, you have optimal growth rate, you can do your policies and all that, you can private and social optimum. But actually, I want now to start with this, uh, develop this thing which I think could be used for communication. So let's, for, let's do four quadrants. So it's a bit like the ISLM, maybe it's inspired from macro or whatever, or from the hoteling rules also, you can also do it like this. So let's start with the lower right. I have on the uh, axis, on the horizontal, I have T. On the vertical axis downward, I have the stock S. So you start with the maximum stock in the beginning, and then you deplete. So the stock is a function of time. And now, of course, this is, a, is an optimal depletion rate now here, but you can also, you, you can explore different things. I think, for example, so this is collected to hoteling of, uh, rule, of course. I think, for example, uh, one thing that we are really um, stressing too much in, in theoretical economics is, is the, uh, the capacity of, of, of uh, agents to, to look into the future. They have to optimize over infinite horizon. And in many cases, it's just not feasible or it's just not, uh, well, it's not realistic. But whatever we do here, we get a depletion uh, path for S. And we could also go flat and then have a, well, we can do many things here, but this is what comes out in, the, in an optimal uh, depletion. Then we can flip it over to pollution stock. So this, this angle is given by the theta, uh, phi, by this impact parameter. So whenever we have extracted S, then this translates into pollution. So there is this nice picture in IPCC, I don't know if you know them, uh, if you've seen this, uh, you have some carbon stock in, in the ground and then you, once you pump it up, it's in the atmosphere. So this is kind of given by this red line here, you transform the S into P. And then the P has to go into the damage, of course. So I have in the vertical axis uh, to, to, to the top, I have D. And this depends on the pollution stock. And now, attention, here I have uh, several options, of course. What is exactly a damage function? If you talk to climate scientists, if you talk to, to, to impact modelers uh, from natural sciences, they come up with all kinds of stories about uh, species which die out, about, uh, uh, well, fires which increase, all kinds of things. But nobody really knows what, what the optimal damage, what, the, what a good damage function would look like. So my solution here is I try several options. I have a convex, I have a concave, and I have a concave convex. And as I think here, we, we take it afterwards, we take it as a share of capital, which is depreciated. The share should, between, should be between zero and one. I kind of think this convex, concave does, does make sense. So we appro approximate uh, the uh, depreciation rate of one, uh, well, uh, gradually. So this, this would make, say that the, the line which is there, that would is, uh, this is the one I'm, I'm working with. But I can also vary. I can vary all the, you know, the idea is here, I, I can, on all, on all aspects of this picture, I can vary and then see what, what, what is the outcome in the end uh, for what I want to know. Before I do the solution, let me say what are now on the upper right, what are the things I'm, I'm going after. First of all, just out of the, of the two-sector model, you have a capital accumulation equation. This is basically what I had before. So you can divide by a K, by capital, and you get capital growth. But you see this capital growth still depends on this epsilon, how this sectoral allocation is done of the capital into the capital accumulation sector, final goods sector. So this has to be optimized, and uh, this is why we do all this optimization stuff, we do this uh, Hamiltonian, and then we find out how it is done. And so we, we see for capital growth, on the one hand, we have a, a gross capital productivity parameter, which is important, driving the economy. On the other hand, we have a depreciation rate, which is driven by pollution, by climate change. These two elements, uh, one is positive, one is negative. 
they determine uh, the development of the economy in the long run. And now optimal consumption growth is not obvious. Uh, you, there you really have to do a calculus. You have to do some, some further steps in the appendix or wherever. That this is what I get for the optimal consumption growth, and this is what I want to explore now further. Uh, exactly in parallel to the other one, I have a productivity parameter. I call it omega, I guess. Then I have a climate change uh, effect, uh, the second one, which is, I think, a lambda. And then the third effect would be this counting. This is the delta. So I have these three effects. And if I want to know about the growth rate of the economy in the long run, I must, uh, well, calculate or show in my diagrams how big these three things are. And then uh, you see that uh, the first one is independent of time, the last one is independent of time, but the, the, the one in the middle, the depreciation, the, the natural induced depreciation term is depending on time. So the solution would look like this first. If I now complete my picture and I go to the upper right and I look at the depreciation term, this lambda, you can see I can now carry over what I had as a depreciation in terms of pollution. I cannot have my de uh, depreciation in terms of time. So for each point in time, I know what is the extracted quantity, what is the uh, pollution amount in the atmosphere, what is the impact on depreciation rate, and now what do I have as a depreciation each moment in time. And this I can confront with the other two guys I had in the previous growth equation. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. Yeah, here is quite good, actually. On this, that screen, it's not so good. This is a bit better, so I have three screens to choose from. So you can see that the, uh, well, this is the three elements I had in the equation before. So it's, it's the pure product, the gross productivity, and then the gross productivity minus the impatience with the row, this, this discount factor. You have seen it from the utility function. And there, uh, as a difference between uh, this two, uh, well, the, the upper two and the depreciation rate, I, I, I get consumption growth rate as, a, well, as, as, as one of the well, in variables which I'm interested in. And now, so this is, this is the full thing. First, well, the first, first try, say. And now the idea would be that I now start to vary things. I, I can do policies, I can vary assumptions, and I want to see what happens now with, with my economy. And uh, let me stress first, the first part or the main part will be on growth effects. There are also level effects, I'm, I'm well aware of that, and these level effects are also important, but uh, I talk now about growth effects first. So, what, for, for example, what I can do is to say, well, I want to, well, I think the damage function is not correct like this. You know, there was a dispute between Nordhaus and then Weizmann, and they had, uh, well, uh, you, you take different parameters and then you shift up this damage function, and you can easily see by comparison uh, that, of course, the growth rate diminishes well, as soon as the damage, as, as you would expect, and it also can converge to zero, it can also become negative. It depends really. You see how important the damage function is already from this picture. I can also have a, a purely convex uh, damage function, not have convex concave, but uh, go that's like this. You see I can still calculate or I can still depict what is the impact of the growth rate of consumption. Still, I might get off with it uh, if, if, you know, if you know, I have still a concave uh, function for, for the stock of, of, uh, of fossils. So it might be that the growth rate in the long run is still positive, but probably it's not true. It depends really on how these curves look like and how they relate to each other. Then I might also think that we have delays in climate damages. This is also disputed, or that the, you know, the relationship between when, when I uh, have emitting greenhouse gases and the, the pollution impact, there is some kind of a, a nonlinear relationship. I can also do this. So then the, the pollution impact would be a bit delayed, and it would also be later. But in the first phase, you would have a less of a depreciation. And in the second phase, when you have the intersection there on the lower left, then you would have a higher depreciation. Again, you can. You can just draw, you know, these rectangles just say, in principle, you solve this uh, system of equations, this gives you a consistent solution, and then you can again depict and you can show uh, how the impact is on the consumption growth rate. Or we can also work a bit more with the productivity. So far, I had it that only the depreciation was time dependent. And this is just the focus of, of climate change economics. We look at what is the impact of climate change. But on the other hand, when we deplete natural resources, it might also be that we have an impact on capital productivity. And this is probably not happening in one sector model, but in, in, in multi-sector model it easily happens. This is joint work with Jacques Smolders, earlier work where we show when you have a, a sectoral change, when the sectoral change, there are some assumptions there, but it might be the sectoral change increases your capital productivity. 
then not only the depreciation is depending on time, but also uh, the uh, productivity of capital is depending on time. Because the, at the same time, when you deplete, you make several sectors, sectors smaller and others bigger. And this may, might have an impact on capital productivity. Actually, the, the condition there is that the sectoral change goes in the right direction. It should go into what we call, you know, the, the sectors with higher value added, so high-tech sector, whatever we might call it, and not go into stagnating, uh, not into beer production, into things where we are not innovative. When innovation, capital accumulation dies out, then it goes the other way around. So we can also produce here with sectoral change, we can also produce productivity development, which is going the other way around, and then you have from, from, two, from two sides you have a squeeze of the consumption growth rate. Here comes the case now for climate risks, and uh, this is where, of course, the level effects are important. Because if I did now this picture for um, just growth rates, it would just be flat. It would be a nice picture. Because what we do in this model is we have a growth model, basically an AK model, not, not much more. Well, here is a BK model. But in fact, what happens from time to time when you have a climate shock, then the economy has just, you know, the capital is, is destroyed shockwise. And then you have uh, a depreciation, well, you have the capital uh, impact, you have the, the climate impact function, which is stepwise. And whenever you have one of these shocks, then the economy is hit and the capital income consumption, they all drop with the same rate. And of course, uh, and after this, after the shock, you have the same growth rate as you had it before. Of course, this depends a bit on the model assumptions, but this is what we do here. And so... Here, we can only show, show the effects when we do levels, and this is, I multiply the, the damage by K, and I have on the top now no longer D, but I have K, and you see now this is the development of the capital stock over time, and you see that the, the slope, K dot, is, is between the shocks, it's the slope of the curve, and when the shock hits, this is exactly how much capital is destroyed. And this is also something that we can extend and we can calculate what the impact is on optimal policy. So I talked about several things that we could do here, and I could, we could do many other things. One thing which uh, recently attracted our attention was expectations. We believe uh, it's a major, you know, most of our models are history-driven. History, driven. history de de determines the equilibrium. You start somewhere, you inherit the capital stock, you have a resource stock, and then you do whatever is, is, has to be done. You optimize in the temporary and you converge to an equilibrium. And if you want to have the equilibrium changed, you have to implement policy, which is often considered to be costly, because uh, history is a very strong determinant of the long-run equilibrium. If you have an expectation-driven equilibrium, you might recall the, the paper by Krugman, expect, uh, History versus Expectations, we did the same, time for, uh, same for, for energy transition, it might, might look different. And this is an interesting thing which one can uh, extend the model and also do uh, more applications here. <coughs> Related to this, I think many, uh, yeah, many, uh, well, if you, if you change the energy system, for example, if you, if you have the uh, transition from carbon to, to green, this will be non-linear and there will be tipping points. You have uh, network effects, you have uh, infrastructure effects, all this could also be captured here. So population growth is not in political economies, it's disregarded, trade, north-south, all these distributional things could be added. And also what's not in here is renewable energies, we just have this, this fossil, we can, we, can, uh, we can replace it by capital, which is clean by definition here, but of course one can do more in terms of clean technologies. Let me talk in a second part here about policy. Of course, well, we have now this basic climate model, we have designed kind of uh, these quadrants. We have an idea what, what has an impact on, on what. <coughs> and now we have to also find out whether this design can be used to, to show what policies are doing. And of course, when we have externalities well known, we have a private optimum which uh, deviates from the social optimum. We have uh, distortions. And in the present uh, model, we have a dirty input, then we have a clean input, then of course the input uh, use and the input mix is distorted. And this can, of course, be, uh, according to traditional prescription, it can be uh, fixed by, by taxation or by a permit system, and then uh, it would be done. But, of course, uh, there's much more with it, and this would then be my last part. Uh, we have to carefully think, because uh, Simone kindly mentioned my, my activity at the climate negotiations, uh, it's much uh, more complicated than just a optimal PIGO tax is, is this amount, and now you please do it. It never will work like this, and this is exactly... Uh, yeah, we, we have to consider this. So maybe we come to this at the point, but we are not, not there, not at all. And then uh, finally, um, 
this talk about the discount rate, I have not included it here, but well, of course one can also, because you've seen how it has an impact on the growth rate, we can also have it here, this discussion. Let me just show you quickly that the same diagram can be used for abatement, for, a, well, for different kind of policies, say. If you happen to have something like carbon capture sequestration, if you happen to have something like circle or the carbon circle or carbon farming, then what you would do is for the current extraction, you would have less of, a, of an impact, uh, less of a pollution. You would reuse one, some of the carbon or you would uh, store, some, store some of the carbon. Then you had a shift in your pollution function. And then you can see, of course, this gives a relief in terms of damages. On the other hand, I assume here, and I think you would have to spell it out more clearly, that probably for such policies you need some part of your capital, so you have to subtract something more. First you have to subtract from the gross productivity of capital, you have to subtract what the, the factor of your impatience, and then you subtract something for implementing your policy, providing carbon capture uh, uh, facilities and all that, and then you have two curves shifting, and you have, uh, as a result, again, the difference between the two curves gives you the consumption growth rate. But this is not satisfactory for many reasons. I mean, I did not work out all these policies in detail now, but I could probably do it. But uh, what, what's happening in these hoteling models, and it has been criticized also, I mean, I, I like to include all this uh, resource extraction because some people just talk about dirty machines and clean machines, and it's never really clear why, why the dirty machines are dirty because there's, uh, it's not obvious from the model. Here we have it, but what happens in such, uh, when we do climate policies somehow, we still want, in a hoteling model, we still want to extract the whole stock in the long run. And this seems to be not right for, for many reasons. So we think uh, one should not uh, advocate this. In, in models, it might, arise, uh, it might arise because we have the positive discounting and the later damage will probably not be so harmful from today's perspective. And then on top, you might have some decay. And if you combine this, then of course, it might be good to, it's always good to shift it out. But on the other hand, people think, well, um, these, these uh, damages will still be there. And, you know, the 2 degrees Celsius target that we always talk at the, at the COP, or you know, the 1.5 degrees Celsius target. This is not about shifting extraction to the future. It's really about limiting the extraction at, at the absolute level. And so this would say, well, you, you pollute up to a certain level, and then when, when you have the critical level, the damages would, would increase disproportionately with very steep marginal damage function. So this should then be looking different. And, this would then call for a different policy, not, not simply shifting this, this curve to the lower left, but what we could do in the model here, what we, can, uh, what we can advocate, is that we should decommission some of the stock. So, I mean, this is what uh, Bart Haastad uh, had, had uh, recently, but uh, I think it should be done in a different way, but, but the mechanism is clear. The stuff which is in the ground should not uh, entirely be pulled out, but, but should be left in the ground. And you see the red bar here, I just assume that this the, the resource stock, which is between the red bar and the origin, is not available for extraction. Then you would adjust, so you, you just undo this resource stock, you, you ignore it, you don't include it in your optimization, and what you do then, you do a depletion path which is approximating the red line and not, not the, uh, the axis uh, in the origin. But of course, how can you do this? Uh, this is now really uh, about the climate policy, climate negotiation, so you would decommission some of the stock, would you reduce the stock by policy impact, so maybe you have some cost with it, then would also, on the upper right, you would have a shift of the productivity curve, and then you would have a new growth rate uh, for the economy. But of course, we tend to think, if you believe in the two degrees Celsius target, if you believe that the, the marginal damages really have a very steep, uh, well, they become very steep after two degrees Celsius warming, or 1.5, then we should decommission definitely some of the stock, and not just delay these things uh, into the future. Adaptation, this is now easier, this is to the upper left, we can just say, well, the damages which are there, if we, we, we use part of our capital for adaptation, we build higher dams, we build better houses, more uh, resistant, how, re resilience houses, this is, resilience is a big issue now, then we lose part of the capital for our normal growth, but we can reduce uh, the impact of pollution on the damages, so the damage function would a bit uh, be shifted downward. Now, I think you have seen now my design, Maybe it's enough now, so I should uh, change subject a little bit. And this is what I want to do for the final part. I wanted to talk about when we have now more or less agreed on what are the, what are the issues, what are uh, the basic ingredients of, of our climate uh, economics model, what can our policies do, now we have to implement these policies. 
I think one of the mistakes, frankly, that we do or we did in environmental economics, we were really pushing efficiency of policy. We say this is an efficient policy you should implement. And in a country, it might work because you have a government with a majority and you tell them they should implement the carbon tax and probably they will do it. On the international level, at the international level with, with 194 countries, it is really not about efficiency, it's, it's much about equity. It's really about how are the burdens distributed, implicitly or explicitly. These are countries, they really are very careful to check what are the others doing. So you, you're well known what, what's on the second bullet we have at the moment. We have a high target in international climate policy, but we are not, by far we are not there. We have a bottom-up approach, all the countries contribute something, but what, what's the result is this UNEP language, an emissions gap. So this is way more emissions that we actually would, would, uh, would be allowed to, to have. And on the, on the other hand, we have what I call the ambition gap. It's, it's not enough what the countries are planning to do for the next years. We would have to increase our ambition. And then finally, we also have an assessment gap because what is now, what, what we try to do in the future will be this global stock take. You notice know, every five minutes, uh, well, five, every five years, we try to, to check where we are. We should do it every five minutes. Eh? <laughs> so every five years, uh, 20, uh, 23 on, uh, the, the countries, well, the COP will see where are we um, emission wise, and then we should increase our ambition, but it's not really clear how this will go. Because somehow people believe, uh, yeah, the world will be better, maybe. Maybe they, they hope for technology, they hope for, for some good governments. Uh, I think we can be quite happy with China, we can be quite unhappy with other big uh, polluters. So uh, it's all kind of uncertainty in this process. So the idea is now, when we have the optimal policy design, how can we now somehow trigger this, this uh, increasing ambition over time? So how would this go? And no, I still have one design. You, you already saw this decommission of stock. The idea would be we first decommission a little bit, and then we see it's, it's not enough. We still burn too many fossil fuels. So we have to, to push it harder, and this over time should then look like uh, in this uh, figure. What happens next year will be the so-called, did you know this, Talanoa Dialogue. So this, this year, was uh, Fiji was the co-presidency, and uh, they, they brought in this Talanoa uh, idea. So one would have a, a broad, uh, positive dialogue about how to improve the, uh, you know, how to improve the whole situation. And this will be 2018, and the global stock take, as I said, 2023. And the idea now is to find out how can science, how can economics make a, a valuable contribution to this process? Because it's very political and it's not yet clear how, how this really should be getting better. So what, what will happen is, uh, what, what is, what is in the Paris Agreement, people think, well, we will then 2018 and at least 2023, we will see that we are not, uh, well, we have a, an ambition gap and then something has to happen. So all the countries have to go home and think about and then they come back and then they improve. Maybe it's, uh, maybe, of course, they will have to do it because it's all bottom up. We have, but we have to inform them somehow. We have to help them a little bit. And one of the problems uh, is, of course, uh, you know, in, in the Paris Agreement, in many, many uh, articles, I think four or five times, it says you have to explain why and how your contribution is fair and equitable. And some big country just uh, announced what they will do, and they said our contribution is fair and equitable, full stop. So that was the explanation. And now when you look at the text that we have uh, in Bond, which are not decided yet, but which are, uh, well, online, you can all read them, you find equity, equity everywhere, so people are really concerned that it should be equitable, but nobody says exactly what it should be. So I thought instead of always pushing this efficiency, we could also once look into this equity. And I had some uh, research on this, I cannot repeat it all this, but the idea would be that we buy this equity concept, because there is neither right nor wrong, it must be kind of an average feeling. And there are equity principles which are kind of shared worldwide. The capacity or ability to pay or the merit principle, these are, you know, you can also read the literature, they are everywhere and they are broadly accepted. We can apply them to, to climate policy and this is what we should do. Not because uh, that we can ha have a, a direct impact on the countries, but we can probably have an indirect impact by making them uh, aware of that they are uh, lacking ambition. Maybe we can have an impact on voters if they are uh, open to new scientific results and then maybe improve the process like this. So what we actually did, and you're uh, happy, uh, well, you're invited to, to, uh, to, to try this out. Uh, we have a climate calculator. You can see for the different countries, if you have the so, implication of equity principles, 
how this could look like for, for many countries, for your countries, we have a, a flexible approach. We don't say you have necessarily to take this or that principle. You can, you can choose a bit and you can give them weight. One of the issues is uh, historic responsibility. How far should you go back? We think a natural starting point is 1990 before. It doesn't the Indians want to go back to 1850. I think it doesn't make sense in many respects. So all these things can be uh, checked and then you can see what would be an equitable contribution uh, of your country and you can compare to other countries. So this would be an example for one country. Um, you see where the, the, well, the, the standard, well, the, the business as usual would go. Then you see what, when, when you apply equity principles in a certain way, this would be the blue development. And you see what uh, the pledges are currently. And you see according to this, uh, uh, well, the, the, the comparison between the pledges and what, what actually happens with emissions, uh, this is clearly uh, not ambitious enough. And then a last cool slide we did out of this thing. Now for many countries, we checked it. We took an average uh, weighting of these equity principles, a very moderate, uh, well, say, implementation of, of what we call uh, yeah, this, this, this carbon budget approach, distribution on the countries. And what you find out here and what you can see is a world map. Here you can see, you, you compare what the policies are, the intended policies of the countries, and what actually their equitable share would be for, a, for carbon policy. And you can see green is rather positive, and then it becomes red, and it becomes a bit brownish, and this is the not so positive. Now, of course, according to the Paris Agreement, it's, it's not allowed to feed this in directly and to finger point the countries and say you have to be more ambitious, but I still, I think science can, can come up with these conclusions and provide these pictures, and I think it's relatively clear how, how it works. And I think some governments will be happy if they, you know, this is a big country there, which is a bit orange. If this becomes more yellow and green, I think this, this government will probably be happy. So you can kind of inform people and can show uh, that they can increase their ambition uh, with, uh, uh, with having a, a stricter climate policy. So I want to conclude. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I think I'm still reasonably well. Uh, I wanted to also, of course, leave some time for discussion. It depends on you. You, you, you can then choose. If, you, if you're hungry, then you don't ask questions. If you're, you can do it. You know, at the margin, you can see where marginal utility is higher. OK, and there will also be some externalities. If somebody asks too many questions, the other are, are hungry. So we, we have to find out the equitable burden sharing exercise. I started, yeah, well, the most part of my talk was about this basic climate model. I wanted to develop this uh, general approach, a unified approach, unifying the most important elements as I see them. And if you're convinced, and if you're teaching, then uh, please consider, uh, well, disseminating the knowledge. If you think it sh should be improved or should be dismissed, please let me know. What I think, with this uh, basic climate model, you can show crucial relationships. You can show how important they are. You can modify in each of the quadrants. You can, you can uh, change the shape. You can, you can see what it does with the economy. And uh, especially, I think, also with students, but also policymakers, it's always good to have something, a figure, something that visualizes uh, the main results and not just Hamiltonians, because this is uh, hard to digest. So I thought this is a priority in, in, in teaching communication. And uh, of course, it would also be useful uh, for us as economists to, to agree on something that we, we think, well, this is the core, and then we can still have, you know, you have, you know, this morning we had carbon trade, this is not included, as you said, Simone, I, I cover many things, but this I did not cover, so uh, specific policies could be added or should be left separate, but basically what do we think in climate economics should we do and how should we treat this? And then, of course, we still have uh, lots of uh, possible extensions uh, which, are, uh, well, which can be done with the model. And in the end, as usual, once we have a good framework, and actually this would be the order of, of the normal way in economics, we have a good theory, then we use calibration or we go to the data. Uh, somehow in climate economics, uh, we were caught on the, on the wrong foot. It was somehow difficult, and this has led to the criticism, as you have seen in the beginning. So kind of, I tried to go a big, bit back, step backward, do a ref reflection, and then from here, I think we can build up on something that we think is really more robust, more reliable, reliable and, and better uh, to frame future policies. Thank you very much. <laughs>